Hmm. I've been thinking lately about being disappeared. Especially insidious is this administration's ability or intention to disappear people. I think of journalist Jamal Khashoggi's disappearance at the Saudi consulate in Turkey a couple of weeks ago. Hundreds, I think also of hundreds of children of asylum seekers who are still locked away in internment camps in our country, whose information was lost and now may never be returned to their families. I am thinking about my transgender friends and the administration's recent memo attempting to deny the very fact of their existence. I think also of young Matthew Shepard, the gay teenager in Wyoming whose beaten body was missing for 18 hours, not found in time to save his life. And yet, his legacy and his family's commitment defy his disappearance from the map of our national history. This past Friday, 20 years after his death, Matthew Shepard found his final resting place in the highly visible National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., where he is now interred right next to Helen Keller. His life and his death will not be disappeared from our nation's story. The Reverend Marion Buddy, bishop at the um, National Cathedral, sees uh, Matthew Shepard's memorial becoming a place of holy pilgrimage for Americans. You see, death does not have to disappear us. This is why I love Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos, and All Saints Day. People's lives, their efforts, and their memories still have so much work to do and so much to say to us, to those of us who remain. Right now, our ancestors are telling us to write a different story for our time. Do you hear them? In this book we've been following in this, with this worship series, book titled Active Hope, Joanna Macy highlights the three stories of our time. And get ready, because you're going to be hearing a lot of, a lot of things in threes in the course of this sermon. <clears throat> the first story is business as usual. When you are living in the middle of this story, well, this is one that assumes that economies should and will continue to grow, that wealth acquisition is the most important value, and that buying things will save you. When you are caught up in this story, it is easy to think that this is just the way things are. The main plot is getting ahead, supported by subplots of finding a partner, providing for your family, getting a nice house, looking good, and buying stuff. In this view, the problems of the world are seen as far away and irrelevant to our daily lives. This is a story of competition, and isolation. In this story, oh, then there's the second story. The second story is the great unraveling. And in this story, we are struck by how many issues are triggering alarm. Economic decline, social division and war, mass extinction of species, climate change. For increasing numbers of people who are living in disaster areas that were hit by hurricanes, or war zones, or famine, well, they are already living in this story, the story of the great unraveling. Not to be overly grim, but for people who are living in the middle of these two stories of our time, the options are either, it's not that bad, or it's already too late. Either way, there is a resigned acceptance. But I want to focus today on the third story of our time, the great turning. In this story, what's catching on is commitment to act for the sake of life on earth with vision, courage, and solidarity. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the IPCC uh, climate change report a few weeks ago, that came out, that was released a few weeks ago, after a lifetime of meatloaf, steak, and hamburgers, <laughs> I went right home and my husband James and I discussed it for literally 60 seconds, if not less. And we just, our family just gave up red meat, red meat, <clears throat> just like that, without fanfare, without looking back. 
I wonder if some of you had that type of immediate response. Did you know that as of right now, today, there are over two million organizations working towards ecological sustainability and social justice across the world? Two million organizations, that's more than ever before. You see, there is a great turning afoot. We are already at the beginning of this story. Now, don't be surprised if you have not read about this epic transition in major newspapers or seen it reported in other mainstream media that's really trained to catch a story that is going to catch the camera, right? These little moments. We need to train ourselves instead to notice the larger pattern and recognize how the story of the great turning is happening in our time. Once seen, it is easier to recognize, and then, once we've recognized it, we can begin to see ourselves in it. So how do you become a player in the story of the great turning? Joanna, Joanna Macy suggests there are three dimensions of the great turning, you see? The first dimension is holding actions. So holding actions aim to hold back and to slow down the damage being caused by the political economy of business as usual. They also counter the unraveling of our social fabric. Being a part of a congregation is a holding action. So you're already doing it. You're already a player in the story. So is welcoming refugees to your home for a meal. So is, um, I was watching last night, um, all the Jewish communities in, in Pittsburgh coming together for a vigil to sing and pray and proclaim solidarity and peace and love. Well, that's a holding action. So is installing solar panels, going vegetarian. Or you could count monarch butterflies, like my UU friend Terry Elselton does each season in the Smoky Mountain National Park. He is a retired high school chemistry teacher who spends his retirement tracking fauna in the Smokies and posting his adventures on social media so we can all learn from his work. Terry's efforts to track, to count, and release birds and butterflies is his contribution to the great turning story, especially as I and others who see his work, his beautiful photo from just this past week of a butterfly being released from his hand. We, we feel healed, we feel informed by his gorgeous pictures and his stories of species perseverance. Other holding actions include using cloth uh, grocery bags, adding to the strength of campaigns, of boycotts, rallies, direct actions, and protests. These are all holding actions that are essential. <clears throat> they do save lives, they save species, and alone, they are not quite enough. So we come to the second dimension of the great turning. This is life-sustaining systems and practices. This includes rethinking whole structures, the way we do things, and creatively redesigning the structures of our lives. Just last week, I was sitting in my uh, intentionally racially diverse book club, uh, a large group of women, and we were discussing Austin, Austin Channing Brown's recent book, I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. This was the book that uh, Kim Green and I led a discussion series last spring on this book. In her final chapter, Brown writes, and we all read this out loud to each other, this is living in the shadow of hope, knowing that we may never see the realization of our dreams and yet still showing up. I do not believe that I or my children or my grandchildren will live in an America that has achieved racial equality. And so I stand in the legacy of all that black Americans have already accomplished in their resistance, in their teachings, in their voices, in their faith. And I work toward a world unseen, currently unimaginable. So we read that passage out loud together, and there were a few deep sighs across the living room. And there was some laughter eventually. Laughter is the body's expression of hope. What can we possibly do to create a different world? We joked about starting a commune together, all of us, sharing in the tasks, raising our children together, <clears throat> growing food and combining land and other resources, 
The laugh, we also said spouses could visit on the weekends. Anyway, <clears throat> that was part of the dream. The laughter died down, and we sat silently with the idea for a few minutes, rolling it around in our minds like the way a mystic rolls rune stones around in his hands, a little afraid and a little exhilarated by the thrill of imagining a whole new life. Communal living is a life-sustaining practice that is included in the second dimension of the great turning, so why not? Other examples of sustaining practice, the fact that large numbers of people have switched to eating organically, and this has affected farming practices across the United States towards health and sustainability. Also, large institutions divesting from fossil fuels and other economic choices that affirm and uphold, uphold life can all create a new economy. So there are three dimensions, as we know, of the great turning, and Macy says the third dimension is deepening our sense of connection. Well, this is great news for Unitarian Universalists. We are already skilled at honoring the interdependent web of all existence, our seventh sacred principle. We understand ourselves to be a part of the earth, that we are a part of the earth and each other, and that every action we take reverberates throughout time and across geography. By strengthening our compassion, we widen the circle of support that protects us from burnout so we can keep doing the work. Do you see? Changing the self and changing the world are mutually interconnected. There is a saying that important changes often go through three phases. <clears throat> First, they are regarded as a joke, communes. <laughs> Then they are treated as a threat. Finally, they are accepted as normal. Aspects of our current reality that were once dismissed as hopeless dreams include women now have the vote in nearly every country on earth. An African American, an African -American can become the United States president. Apartheid can come to an end in South Africa. Most people now ex accept that the Earth orbits around the sun. <laughs> These were all things once dismissed as hopeless dreams. Lucy Stone organized the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850. She never lived to see women finally get the vote in, in the United States in 1920, but that never stopped her from working her entire life to make that happen. Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for more than 25 years before eventually becoming South Africa's first black president in 1994. 25 years in prison. We can do this. We'll get through this. When we experience frustration, failure, obstruction, or even backsliding like I have really felt this week, it is imperative we remember we are part of a history and a legacy of hope. We must not disappear the hope of our ancestors who call on us to complete the vision we may never see. Do you hear that? We, we cannot disappear the hope of our ancestors. Macy asks us this. Could it be that one day future generations will look back at us now and wonder how we dared to believe we could create a life-sustaining society and dared also to bring it about. And for that to happen, we need the capacity to tolerate frustration, to tolerate this pain. Rather than seeing frustration and failure as evidence that we are pursuing a hopeless cause, we can reframe, reframe them as natural and even necessary features in the journey of social change. So what does success look like for you in the great turning? Well, it doesn't look like having a lot of money or power or fame or beauty or the most followers on Instagram. You've probably figured that out by now. Our individual sense of success must be inextricably linked with the body of humanity and earth. So now, if our measure of, of personal success is, did I, Taryn, stop climate change, well, that will just bring us back to defeat. Instead, find small goals, and sometimes just noticing what is amiss can be a small victory. 
Build your network of support because the great turning is a collective experience. Macy suggests drawing a on, on a piece of paper a constellation of all of the people in your network who you can turn to for support or ideas. Consider that practice. Develop a study action group with three S's, study, strategy, and support. The study part can be a window into a very disturbing reality if you're really doing the studying. And so it's best to do that in groups so you can support each other. And I think the UU Congregation of Atlanta is the perfect place for study action groups to meet. We can do this. Find a listening post in nature, a spot you return to. Go there to reconnect to the interdependent web of life. Feel your place in it. Make it a habit. Recognize enthusiasm as a valuable, renewable resource and follow the inner compass of deep gladness. I appreciate Don's enthusiasm as a renewable resource for us to return to. <clears throat> and remember that laughter is the body's expression of hope. Find your place in the story, which means broadening your definition of activism. So you don't want to go to the protest, okay. What are you going to do? What else can be activism? And finally, redefine what it means to have a good life. And you may already be doing this. The poet reminds us, the bad do not win, not finally. No matter how loud they are, we simply would not be here if it were so. You know, as a child at my UU congregation's Halloween party growing up, I remember dressing up one year as a fortune teller and offering other kids a chance to receive my divination. Uh, I had a big crystal ball, I had a questionable accent, and a, uh, and a whole speech that accompanied the experience. <laughs> but people would get really frustrated with my fortunes because I lacked certainty. <laughs> Instead, I portrayed their future as cloaked in mystery and clouded by the possible choices they would make that would lead to either doom or success. <laughs> well, friends, our collective fortune is no different. There is no crystal ball that hearkens doom. Failure is not imminent. There is only the call to adventure. If we dare to believe and practice a rigorous hope, to hold on to one another for dear life and even long after that, and never, ever let each other be disappeared. We are building the house for tomorrow. <laughs>